Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll briefly talk about using theory to write a paper. So I often get these questions after people watch my videos where I explain literary theory as to if I could give an example of how to use reception theory, how to use uh, new criticism. And I've made an attempt to record a couple of lectures. For example, I have one on how to use structuralist theory where actually I went and talked about an essay written by two structuralist scholars and talked about how they did it. But overall, I mean, the short answer to this question about how should I use theory is always that first you understand the concepts, and after you've understood the concepts, the best way of learning the use of it is by actually going and reading people who might have used a certain theory. So like if you want to understand how discourse can be used, you know, go read Edward Said's Orientalism and you'll see how he employs that concept. That's the best way of learning it. No amount of me explaining an essay would actually help. But today I thought, okay, let's try it once again. So I will be using one of my own essays that I had written about Pakistani fiction in English a few years ago. And I will post the link to the article in the description, so please do download it, print it out. It's openly available. And then you will be able to grasp better uh, as to what I'm trying to say in the essay and how I'm trying to explain my use of theory in that essay. So this particular essay is entitled The Pakistani English Novel, The Burden of Representation and the Horizon of Expectations. And as the title itself probably suggests, that this is me reading not just one specific English novel, of course that's there too, but also Pakistani writing in English from a reception theory perspective. So that's kind of an example of how to use reception theory. But when you say I'm going to use reception theory or reader response criticism, you can't just mobilize it as a general term. You have to then go to one or two particular theorists of reception. So in my case, the moment you saw the term horizon of expectations, if you've read your reception theory, you knew that I'm using Hans Robert Yoss, right? Hans Robert Yoss is the one who theorizes the concept horizon of expectations. And what does he mean by it? Simply stated, I mean, you can read my detailed discussion of the concept itself uh, within the essay. What he means is that at any given moment, readers, because of their lived experience, because of their training, because of the epoch in which they are living and how literature is consumed in it, have a certain horizon of expectations of literary texts. So when they start reading it, they imperceptibly bring that horizon of expectations to the text. And if the text meet, meets that horizon of expectations, then they consider it a good novel. If it doesn't, then they consider it a bad novel. Now, concomitant to that is Hans Robert Yoss's theorization of what he calls the horizontal gap. And what he means by it is that sometimes a literary work can exceed the contemporary horizon of expectation and, and is published in something that has not yet emerged in readers' collective group consciousness. And so between the act of reading and the novel or the work of art itself, there is this gap, this horizontal gap, and when readers are reading it, they will not find that novel good enough or, you know, worthy enough of their attention because it is not meeting the horizon of expectations. And he gives the example sometimes, I think he gives the example of Madame Bovary, that when it came out, everyone panned it, the critics disliked it, because the novel was too ahead of the existing horizon of expectations, so 
until that horizontal gap got filled by critical work, critics then come back to it and read it differently. So that's what he means. So what I did in this essay was I was trying to theorize and discuss the Pakistani novel in English and its reading by Pakistani readers. And why is it that the Pakistani readers find these novels as overly critical of Pakistan, they have emotional responses to it, they think that the Pakistani authors are not doing a good job of representation. So there was this conflict between the readers and the writers. On one end of it was the extreme of the authorial right to represent. On the other end was the readers' expectations of the text. So I realized that there was a horizontal gap while the authors claimed or at least inhabited a space where they said, well, we have a right to represent Pakistan any which way we like because we have authorial freedom, the readers were not reading the, the novels with that understanding. Their horizontal gap was that they wanted those novels to be, if not totally, uh, you know, in favor of Pakistani cultures, to be somewhat favoring of Pakistani culture and its tropes. So they were reading it as, as an act of betrayal, right? So my argument was that the one way we can understand that is by understanding that there is a horizontal gap between the Pakistani English readers and their expectations of a novel written by a Pakistani and the authorial right to represent. So. That way, if you read the essay carefully enough, that is what the question that it's trying to answer is, why do so many Pakistani readers find it troubling when they read Pakistanis, diasporic or native Pakistanis, when they write about the novel, right? Why are their expectations so different from what, what the writers claim they write to represent? Right? And I was trying to do it through reception theory because I was trying to trace the reader response. Right, So I think that essay can be a good example of it. Of course, I wrote another book chapter on the same topic, and there I used a different theory. There I used Pierre Bourdieu and his theorization of habitus. And my argument was that the authors who claim absolute freedom to represent Pakistan any which way they like to a global audience they inhabit a cosmopolitan in, uh, habitus. So their way of looking at their cultural production, their literary production is, is kind of unmoved from any obligations to the nation, right? Whereas the readers, most of them reading in English from Pakistan, inhabited a national habitus. And they brought the expectations and anxieties of that habitus to an act of reading. Both of these are two different readings, but the first one that I talked about, if you read the essay, then will explain to you how to use one particular reception theorist to write a paper, right? Now, do keep in mind that as you read the essay, you will understand probably clearly that I first explain my terms, right? I say, here is a concept by Hans Robert Yost. This is how he theorizes it. This is the reason I am using it, beca because it allows me to trace the reader response, right? And there is no moment in that essay, I mean, after all, it's not a perfect essay, no one can write a perfect essay, where I don't explain my own understanding of the reader response theory, specifically as it is coming from Hans Robert Yost. And that's another important lesson to learn early enough in one's career is that when you use theory or a theorist, I mean, of course, you read them carefully, understand them, but in the process of employing that theoretical framework or theoretical way of looking at texts or reception of the text, do go ahead and explain your own understanding of it. There are two advantages of it. One is that anyone who reads your essay will also read it then with an understanding that you have already put in there. So they know that this is how you're reading Hans Robert Yoss and then applying it. And two, 
if someone opposes your point of view and says, well, you misread Hans Robert Yaas, you can basically point to it and say, well, I explained my understanding of it. I might have mis misread it, but that's how I chose to read Hans Robert Yaas and use it. So there is a defense against future criticism, but also a service to the reader because in the process of reading your essay, they're not just learning about your critique of a certain topic, they're also learning as to how you are employing the theory, how you're understanding it. So that's just a brief note on one particular essay. Of course, now this lecture is not explaining word by word what I do in that essay. For that, I encourage you to read it. But I thought I should give you, you know, a few pointers about how do we employ theory, right? And give you an example that you can read after you watch this brief video and see here from my, me, here is an example. Now I'm using this essay not because I think it's brilliant or great, but because it's freely available and it is open access and any can, one can download it and read it. So I do encourage you to read this essay and watch this lecture, but also for any other theory when you want to use it. Just go and read other people who might have used it, right? See how they have understood it. And then that act of reading would kind of train your imagination or help you understand how to employ different theoretical frameworks, different theoretical modes of reading the text. Thank you so much. That's all I have today. And thank you so much for joining me every now and then. And if you have not already subscribed to the channel, please do so and uh, become a part of our community. I'll be delighted to have you. And I'm, as always, grateful for your time. Thank you so much. And peace and love.